clap it so you know I deserve it <laughs> at the end. Um, I do. Thank you. Um, so my name is Mike. Uh, I'm usually here pretty much every month, so if you've been here before, you probably recognize me. Um, I'm going to talk this month about Event Machine. Um, and so who am I? I'm a developer at one spot here in town, startup. And I also maintain a couple uh, Ruby gems um, in Cache Client Data Fabric <coughs> and do a lot of hacking on the side. So when I say scalable processing, what am I talking about? Um, in the last five, ten years, Google has really made popular this notion of MapReduce, which is one um, mechanism by which you can sort of spread a workload across many, many machines. More traditionally, uh, you would you would break up a workload into smaller units of work that you would then push onto a message queue, and then have workers, as many workers as you want, grab those messages off the message queue and process them. Um, however, I'm not talking today about how to um, scale across multiple machines. Instead, I'm really here to talk about um, more specifically efficient processing. That is, how do we uh, get our, the most bang for our buck when you're talking about one machine? If you've got a large node in EC2, that's costing you 40 cents per hour. If that machine's only 10% utilized, effectively it's costing you 36 cents an hour um, for that machine that you're not you're not getting the value out of. So we um, we want to focus on on maximizing that that machine's utilization. Um, in in data centers, the, the big guys, Amazon, Facebook, Google, they they try to get up to seven get 80% machine utilization. Any more than that, and you don't have headroom to deal with traffic spikes and spikes in processing. So you, you want to shoot for about 80% utilization of your machine um, to really get uh, to really get your bang for your buck. <coughs> so what's the status quo in processing today? Well, at one spot, our, our status quo, I would imagine, is a lot like everyone else's status quo, which is we've got, a, um, we've got Ruby processes, which are single-threaded, they're several hundred megabytes in size each. And so effectively we get, let's say, one message per second out of these. Okay. Unfortunately, that means our load average on our machine looks something like this, which is pretty pathetic. Now what you can do is you can spin up 10 Ruby processes and maybe get 10 messages processed per second out of that machine. But you're going to be using 200, or I'm sorry, two to three gigabytes of RAM just to do that. Not very efficient. <coughs> The reason for that is that usually when you're processing a message, it's going to look something like this. <coughs> you're on your CPU, then you make it called a simple DB, and you wait. And then you get the results back, you do a little more processing, then you've got to go to S3. And so on and so on. You hit the database, you hit a couple of web services, all that adds up, and all of a sudden your CPU is only being utilized some small percentage of the time. So my rule of thumb is, your message queue processor is going to spend 90% of the time waiting on I.O. and only 10% actually on the CPU if you spend. So how can we how can we get around this? How can we how can we get that, that CPU pegged 100% of the time? Well, how do we get around this blocking issue? We we add indexes to the database table, we put data in memcached so that we're not blocking as long, so that we're spending more time on the CPU. But really these are these are kind of workarounds to the underlying issue, which is we have to block and sit there waiting for the data that we need to process. And, and like it or not, blocking I.O. is everywhere. Anytime you do file, SQL queries for the database, even hitting memcache is a blocking I.O. call. It's a really fast blocking I.O. call, but it's still blocking. Calling out the web services, even something uh, that you don't even think of, like a DNS lookup. To hit a web service, first thing you need to do is call out to your DNS server to get its IP address first. That's blocking. Even something like uh, shelling out to a child process is blocking. You gotta wait for that child process to return. So, again, the question is, how do we maximize this blue? I want a, a straight blue bar across time so that I know the machine's being picked and being utilized efficiently. So the answer in other systems is threading. In, in, in the Java VM, you'd spin up 10 threads, have each thread take an operation, and you do 
ten, you process ten messages concurrently. If, if each process, or I'm sorry, if each operation is taking 10% of the CPU and you're doing 10 concurrently, theoretically you should be able to get 100% CPU utilization. So that's great for Java, but unfortunately it's not good for Ruby. <coughs> the reason is that Ruby has this legacy of thread unsafety and just being generally hostile to threads. Um, extensions and Ruby libraries are, are thread unsafe. Until Rails 2.2, well, I should say, Rails, to, um, Rails was not thread safe until Rails 2.2. On top of this, Ruby's had poor thread implementation. Ruby 1.8 has green threads. Green threads means the operating system doesn't know anything about the threads. And as a result, <laughs> your threads don't use more than one CPU at a time. You have to use native threads to have threads executing on multiple CPUs at the same time. <coughs> Ruby 1.9 has native threads. <coughs> but unfortunately, because of this history of thread unsafe extensions and libraries, Ruby 1.9 does not allow Ruby code to execute on more than one thread concurrently. It has what's called a global interpreter lock. And so if Ruby is executing in one thread on a, on a, on a core, <coughs> all the other Ruby threads are locked out and cannot execute at the same time. <coughs> JRuby is the only good threaded solution. If you do need have, if you do need multi-threading, <coughs> you can use JRuby. Uh, MacRuby also has a good threading solution. Of course, it's less mature than JRuby. <coughs> so, <coughs> what we need is something that will allow Ruby to have one operation on the CPU while other operations are, are waiting on blocking I.O. That would allow us to fill in the green gaps so that we can get solid blue all the way on that timeline. But we can't use threads because Ruby doesn't do threading. And that's essentially what asynchronous or evented I.O. is. We have two operations here. The second one's on the CPU. It, it makes a blocking I.O. call, and we flip to the other operation. Right? <coughs> Once that, that's, that first operation makes a blocking I.O. call, and then we wait for one of those I.O.s to finish. The second, I, the second operation's I.O. finishes, it starts up on the CPU again. And we, do, we have this ping-pong effect where we're ping-ponging between all these various different operations based on who can run at a given moment in time. So that is essentially what Event Machine gives you. The event machine is a Ruby implementation of what's called the reactor pattern. I've got a definition here of it. The reactor pattern is a concurrent programming pattern for handling service requests delivered concurrently to a service handler by one or more inputs. The service handler then demultiplexes the incoming requests and dispatches them synchronously to the associated request handlers. That probably doesn't mean anything at all to any of you. It certainly doesn't make a lot of sense to me. But that's essentially a long-winded way of saying what I just said, which is it's a pattern which allows us to interleave multiple operations based on <coughs> their I.O. Only one of those operations will be on the CPU at any given moment in time. And, and like I said, it's single-threaded, so we don't have to worry about thread safety in our code. So how does it work? <coughs> well, in a word, uh, the select system call. The select system call has been in Unix for decades now. Um, if you if you want to know the low level details of exactly how a bit machine works, I suggest you read up on the system call and just and, and get a feel for what it does. Essentially, what what it does is the application passes in a set of I/O operations <coughs> or file descriptors that it's interested in knowing when these I/O operations are available for reading writing or errors. And the operating system then takes care of waiting on that stuff. The operating system does it you know, a lot more efficiently than an application can. Now, in the, in the few decades since Select uh, became available, there's higher performance versions of the Select call. There's ePoll on Linux, KQ, and DevPoll on Solaris. Um, so anytime you see sort of an event-driven system, oftentimes you'll see we support these four mechanisms for doing event-driven I.O. Um, 
I don't know the first thing about Windows anymore, and I'm sure something like Select is available on Windows, but I don't, I don't know the specifics of it. I do believe that Event Machine does support Windows, but um, you'll have to do your own investigation if, if Windows is a concern to you. So this all sounds perfect, right? Well, it's not without issues. There are some limitations, some interesting side effects to this. <coughs> the first side effect to the reactor pattern is inversion of control. Your code no longer executes as step A, step B, step C. And that's because it happens asynchronously. <coughs> what instead you do is you say, I want to call A, and then you pass in a callback that event machine will execute once A is finished. So instead of A, B, C, you get a series of nested operations, and nested blocks where you say, do A, and then when that is done, do B. And so you get a, um, instead of a, a clean step one, two, three flow, you get a, a, a series of nested blocks. Error handling is difficult because <coughs> exceptions aren't thrown through your code, they're thrown into a vent machine. Okay, so it can be a lot harder to figure out um, if something goes wrong and, and to recover from that error. Uh, fibers do make the application code a little bit cleaner. I'll, I'll, I'll explain how that works here shortly. So this is <coughs> this is what it looks like. This is what I was talking about. This is I'm going to spend a little bit of time on this slide because it's important. This is one of the key slides to understand. But this is essentially what event machine code looks like. First thing we're doing is we're calling em run. That starts the reactor. You have to have a reactor running. To, to use event machine, period. Within the reactor, we have a block that executes. That's our application code. Okay. Now, in this case, our application code is just three, three statements. <coughs> First thing we do is we're going to make a SQL query, then we're going to write to S3, and then we're going to write to simple DB. When all that's done, we're going to stop the reactor, which effectively exits our application. However, that's not the, that's not the order in which things execute. First, <coughs> one executes. That calls make SQL query. Make SQL query sets up the asynchronous call with the vent machine and then returns. The code within that do block does not execute right now. It executes at some point in the future when that SQL <coughs> query has, has returned with the data. <coughs> As Ruby developers, we're used to passing in a block to a method. And usually that method executes that block internally, right? So the block sort of executes during that method invocation. That's not the case for event machine code. This is a true callback. It's being called at some point in the future. So one executes, and then two executes. Okay. Now our application code is done. It's finished. The only thing we've done is we've told event machine, send the SQL to the database, and then wait for the response. Once the response comes back, then your, your block is called with the, with the, um, the, the results. Then three is executed. The exact same thing happens again. We set up our call to S3, and then we exit. Our callback will call, be called at some point in the future. Once S3 is responded, then we, it calls the callback, which executes four. Same thing happens. And then once SDB has responded, then we can stop the reactor, and we're done. That's essentially the way event, code, event machine code looks on Ruby 1.8 series of nested callbacks. Now, fibers make, make things a lot easier, a lot simpler to sort of understand. Because a fiber, um, you can do your sort of your own uh, control over the way code executes. You don't need to use callbacks. That's a, you can make it look like you're not using callbacks. Essentially, what we're doing here is we make it look like we're doing A, B, C. And the way we do that is we hide inside each of these methods um, some fiber magic, which makes our, our asynchronous code look like it's, it's blocking or synchronous. The way that works is we grab the current fiber, we set up our asynchronous call with the event machine, passing in a block. And all that block is going to do is resume our fiber once, once that call has finished. And then fiber yield is called. And fiber yield just says, stop my application code from running and give control back to some other fiber. That some other fiber is going to be what's event machine is running on. Yeah. 
fiber is one nine nine. What's that? Could you describe it? Sure. A fiber. A fiber um, is a green thread, essentially a user level thread. It's a. Um, it's <coughs> like a thread, except the uh, Ruby doesn't know anything about it. Uh, the operating system doesn't know anything about, it, or rather, it doesn't control it. You have to explicitly give up control. You have to yield for the system to context switch to another fiber. So it's like a normal thread, except you control the context switching. So what we're doing here is we're giving up uh, execution to event machine. Event machine has already had this asynchronous call set up, so it's listening, waiting for that I.O. to come back. Once it comes back, it calls this callback, and all that callback does is resume the fiber's execution. We pass in the arguments to it, and those arguments are what's returned from fiber yield. So essentially, we're doing a callback, but to our code in the EM run block, it looks like a blocking call. And so that way, event machine code can look a lot more like normal Ruby code. That's easier to understand. <coughs> Any questions so far? Yeah. yeah. Um, so I can't, I can't quite resolve if the blue stuff is left to the SQL query, but is all the, where does the things that do stuff go? Does any of it go down there in the, so there's the part that has the fiber that method params, mm -hmm. and then there's the part up at the top. Where, where is it that you do stuff? Async call. So make SQL query, you might pass in some parameters to make SQL query, like say the string of SQL okay. that you want to execute, right? Uh -huh. That would be passed into async call to okay. be sent to the database. And so then the, the, the stuff where I actually call the database goes right mm -hmm. above fiber.resume? No, the actual, the actual, the actual um, calling of the event machine APIs to set up sort of the, the actual call would go in async call. <coughs> so my application logic, uh -huh. like the part where I would turn a hash of conditions mm -hmm. and actually construct a query. And yeah, you, know. you would probably, you probably want to do that outside of this method, okay. but you could, you could easily, uh, these orgs that are passed back, uh -huh. this is what the database is returning to you. So you would turn this args into a result set that you could then turn into a hash. I've got an example of a database adapter, a database driver, later on in the presentation, okay. and that, that might yep. sh okay. show you a more real world example of what's going on. Can you say what that blue stuff says? I can't read it. Which, which blue stuff? Uh, the dark blue. The dark blue and the third, second, third, fourth lines. Right here? Dot, 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 some dark blue. Well, that would just make be, equal. this would just be the what, result. What is those characters? What is the blue? What is the character? It, it, it looks just like a blue blob to me. Right here. Equal 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 sign. Sign. Oh, yeah. Oh, okay. I can't tell. Uh, can't see <laughs> so, so my question, uh, uh, great, my question <laughs> is, is that dot, 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 the block that's over here on the left picture? That so would all be, your, all that your would be the Huh? This would be the results of this this method invocation, which would be the same thing as the of, as the results here. So all that code in your block mm -hmm. would be over there in a block that says <laughs> equals make SQL query. Um, what I guess what I'm trying to say here is that we call make SQL query query here, and event machine will pass us in some results a, as arguments to the block to the callback, right? It's the sort of the same same things happening here. We're calling the method, and then we're returning from the method what event machine returns to us. But I guess the question is, if you after you make the SQL query, you want to run 30 lines of code. Where is that 30 lines of code? Uh, it, can, it can be between these two method calls. Yeah. Is this essentially like the old Windows cooperative multitasking? Uh, fibers are, are definitely cooperative multitasking, yes. Okay, thank you. So this, so your calls here is synchronous though in this example, right? I mean, yes. Well, it's synchronous in that this fiber is yielding, and then it's not going to start executing until this async call, until event machine calls this call back. Right, but it, like makes SQL query and right to all those are synchronous calls. They're not going to execute until the previous. <laughs> Correct. Okay. Correct. That's what that's what I'm trying to say about fibers. Is fibers make it look like it's procedural now? You're executing one, then two, then three. Even though under the covers it's actually, it's, it's asynchronous, 
by doing this asynchronously, we can allow other fibers execute in tandem. So now we can get that 10 operations executing concurrently by having these fibers all, they're all yielding, you know, we're ping-ponging between the different fibers as they perform an I.O. Okay, good so far, any other questions? Okay, so as you can see from the previous slide, the code is hard to understand, especially without fibers. Um, you get this series of nested blocks. Um, it's hard to understand the, the, the code flow. <laughs> Um, on top of that, the, the event machine website's not that great. The, uh, the examples they have are, are how to set up like a TCP server that echoes hello world. You know, it's just not a good real world example of, uh, of you know, solving a problem in the real world. There's also this learning curve of just understanding all this. This, this stuff takes, you know, a month or two to sort of grok. And, you know, I've slowly had to work, up with, work with it on weekends to sort of get a feel of how things work. Top of that testing is is very difficult. <coughs> With tests, you're you're used to say, saying just call this method and then and then uh, check the, re the return values. But with event machine code, you can't do that. You have to set up this global reactor first. And then not only that, but you have to you have to execute that code within the reactor. And then the test has to wait until things are done. But because things are executed asynchronously, it's hard to it's hard to deal with that. So in the test unit, you have to uh, set up and tear down a reactor, um, which is hard to do because test unit doesn't have a way of injecting a block that surrounds a test. Um, so you have to lot of, write a lot of testing infrastructure to test event machine code, unfortunately. One of the bigger issues is what I call whack-a-mole, which is your Ruby processes do a lot of blocking I.O. I've, I've enumerated them all, or not all of them, but I've enumerated a lot of them. You know, you access the network, you, you do DNS resolution, you hit the database, you access the web service. All this stuff is blocking I.O. And the more you move your blocking I.O. to event machine, the more you gain places where you can get concurrency. But the converse is true. The more blocking I.O. you do, the less concurrency you get. And so let's say your database driver is not, is not asynchronous. Anytime you hit the database and wait for a query to come back, your process is sitting there dead. <coughs> Nothing, nothing's happening because event machine doesn't know that it can run other operations in the meantime. So you have to, you have to translate a lot of your I.O. to event machine before you'll start to see the scalability promises in it. So let's look at some, some code uh, examples that you can sort of get a better feel for some real world event machine code. <coughs> As I said before, the event machine website's not very good with samples and examples. So I set up my own GitHub repository and started writing some event driven gems and libraries and whatnot that actually solve real problems that you can go and you can check out, <coughs> read through, and sort of see how, how I'm solving various issues. The first one is what I call Thumbnailer. This is some rack middleware that runs on thin that dynamically creates thumbnails from images that are stored in S3. This is actually in production at one spot. Uh, it's, on, it's on Ruby 1.8, it does not use fibers. <coughs> Here's sort of what the core the core code looks like. <coughs> it's rack middleware, so you just have a call method <coughs> which is passed in a request object. We just translate that, that request object, uh, or we translate that environment into a, sort of a, this, what I call the image request object. And then all we do is we tell event machine, at some point, you know, at the next available moment, please execute this block, and then we return asynchronous response. That's it. That's all the rack middleware does when it initially executes. Once the asynchronous response has been returned, then PIN can go and let and, and handle other connections. But at some point in the future, we're going to call this next click callback, next tick callback. And this next tick callback sets up an HTTP request to S3 with the, the location of the image and says, give me this, give me this file. <coughs> 
That's all it, that's all it does. It sets up a callback to be called when it's done, but then it's finished. And then at some point in the future, once that S3 is called, is done, then the callback is called. We take the response body, we convert it to a thumbnail, and then we tell Finn, hey, I'm done with this response. Here's the, here's the bytes of the, of the, the thumbnail. It's a 200, we're, we're done. Obviously, I've removed a lot of error handling and stuff like that. The actual real real world code is, is in my evented repository. I've sniffed a lot of it out so that I can fit this code on one page. But at the heart of it, it's not very complex. So the browser then is, is sitting and, and waiting? Yes. Right? There's an open open socket to the, to the browser. Okay. It's just nobody's doing anything with it until until we call body dot succeed. Then everything's right now. It's it's a little magical trying to understand how the APIs work. That's why I like to see real world examples so that you can see how people have solved problems. <coughs> and you know this this code took me a day or two to figure out how to how to write it. Hopefully it'll save you a couple hours <laughs> if you decide to, to use a machine. So if we're looking at here all the different classes and things that we can see. What what parts of this are actually event machine API? Um, like deferrable the, the body. Event machine the next tick. <laughs> okay. What's deferrable body? Deferrable body is something that comes with thin, I believe. Okay. Asynchronous response is a thin. Thin. <coughs> Asynchron async callback is a thin thing. Um, Rack does not support asynchronous responses right now, so Thin had to sort of create its own standard of how to do that. And Thin is and built so, on Event so um, Machine, right? Yes, Thin is, is a web server, Event Machine based web server. Um, so, so Thin had to come up with this uh, standards by which you could tell it to use asynchronous response. There's an asynchronous response object up at the top, and if you know Rack, um, you return three things. You return first the status code of the response, you return a hash of headers, and then you return an array which represents the body, the response body. And for thin, to tell it to use an asynchronous response, you return negative one. And then in the environment object that you're passed in, there will be an asynchronous async.callback thing that you can call, which says, okay, I'm done with the response, now you can stream it out to the socket give the browser the data that it's requesting. <coughs> Any questions? Yes. So is then only a Ruby web server that you can use the machine with this way? Do you know of any others? I only know of Finn that is a robust web server, event machine based web server. Certainly, event machine is a library by which you can create event-driven servers in general. <coughs> so you could write your own HTTP server if you wanted to, <laughs> but um, I wouldn't write it. Okay, right on. Yeah, um, <laughs> Thin is essentially it's event machine plus Mongrel's HTTP parser, which is really super fast. So um, it's kind of you know best of breed, taking a bunch of components, and throwing them together. Um, so it's 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 actually got some pretty nice performance. My other question is this event machine HTTP request. Mm -hmm. Is that a whole separate library or is it related to any other HTTP libraries that we know? That is a separate library. It's called em http request. It was written by Ilya Grigoric of um, Postring. 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 Postring, yeah. Um, but uh, Postring is a big event driven event machine company. A lot of their infrastructure runs on event machines. So he's uh, he's a big resource when it comes to event machine type information. Okay. This may be a, a stupid question, but so, so you did this, so um, all the requests of people requesting to whatever they're doing, generate images or whatever, don't get queued up behind one another as the thumbnails are getting created? That's actually a good question. It's a really good question. Yes, exactly. Um, if you think about Think about um, <coughs> deploying a Rails app. We used to use Mongrel. Some of you probably still do use Mongrel. But remember, you'd fire up five or six or seven Mongrels 
Well, why would you fire up all those? Because Mongrel can only handle one request at a time. At least before before Rails was threat safe. So if you wanted to handle multiple requests at the same time, you had to have multiple mongrels. Well, with Finn, an event machine, you're not using threads, but each one of these requests is an operation. So while this operation is waiting for S3 to come back, you can have other requests coming in and queuing up and firing off their own S3 requests. So yes, exactly. It's a way of getting concurrency um, so that this this single process can uh, can handle multiple requests at the same time. Are, are you know like are keep alive sense uh, manage and stuff like that keep, keep the waiting connection alive? Like any doesn't the browsers kind of say like where's my data and forget about it after a certain amount of time? Well, after like, after I think browsers are about default to about two minutes oh, okay. for a timeout. Like, okay. Yeah. Okay. And there's, you don't there's such a thing as a TCP keep alive. Yeah. That's happened at the stack, at the TCP stack layer, which the operating system is doing regardless. Okay. So that's not an issue. Right. Um, another, thing, another thing to note uh, is, if you remember that whack-a-mole slide where I said blocking I.O. is everywhere, you've got to be careful, otherwise you'll lose your concurrency. There's two places where I'm doing blocking I.O. here. Anybody know where? File read. File read, file. File read exactly. <coughs> There's no that I know of, there's no uh, asynchronous file I.O. Event Machine does not have an API to do it. And um, as far as I know, Ruby, well, Ruby obviously wouldn't tie into Event Machine, so that file read is blocking. But because I'm reading a little 8K thumbnail off of the, the hard drive, I figured it's probably not that, big of a, not that big of a deal. The other one is the DNS lookup of S3. I'm resolving that host. That's a blocking call. I actually have no idea how to do an asynchronous DNS resolution in a machine. So if anybody knows, let me know. What about two thumb? Actually, the processing. Two thumb is uh, um, it's an image science, which is in memory, but it's actually writing it to the file system, the, thumb, the generated thumbnail to the file system. So yeah, in in the two thumb method, there is a little more blocking. Yeah. Yeah. If I wanted to go for absolute scalability and concurrency. Obviously, I'd want to I'd want to make some effort to asynchronize those those operations too. But for right now, there it hasn't hasn't been an issue. So, say you're applying this in an app, that, say a hundred scripts or more. Do you do you keep this event machine dot next to do close to every I/O operation, or do you abstract up to a higher level and have it wrap, um, you know, say? <coughs> In general, I would say you want to hide as much of this sort of infrastructure, API infrastructure, uh, away from the application code as possible. Right? You want you want this stuff buried down in the guts of your infrastructure. You don't you don't want to have your app developers know and care. So that's why you want one line that calls dot next to the whole app. No, no, that's that's not what I'm saying necessarily. I'm I'm, I'm saying that. Ideally, this would be hid from the application developers. They would not know that they need to call this. They would just call some some other API. Right. Um, that's why I like fibers because they allow you to wrap <coughs> these asynchronous calls so that they look synchronous. You can build what is what looks to be a synchronous API on top of a event machine. Nobody's the wiser. The next next example is what I call Quinot. It's uh, an SQS processing daemon that I wrote, um, much because of this presentation. It's the next generation message processor at one spot. Our, our current processor, like I said, is you know, one message a second, single threaded, taking hundreds of megabytes per process. And the idea with Quanot is that it's going to handle five or 10 messages concurrently for the same amount of RAM, or approximately the same amount of RAM, and, there, and thereby give it, get us much better machine utilization. It's got event-based Amazon Web Service APIs for all the major APIs. And it uses fibers with Ruby 1.9 so that the code, the, the message processing code that you use, looks like normal Ruby code. To, to his point, you, you want your, uh, your application developers not to know or care that you're using event-based APIs. 
to them. It just looks like they're making a SQL query, and then based on the results, they're they're writing a file here. You know, they don't care. Uh, has anyone here used the Mini Magic Library? The Mini Magic Library allows you to say, "Give me the information about a particular image file." <coughs> So you get the type of the image, whether it's a JPEG or a ping or a GIF. You can get the size of it. All, all this is important when you're doing image processing. Well, we use we use Mini Magic, and just like any of the other blocking I/O sources I, I told you about, um, Mini Magic shells out to the Image Magic <coughs> binary on the command line to actually do its work. So that's a system call, and so that's blocking I/O. So I, I wrote an evented version of Mini Magic called Event Magic, <coughs> which just ports it to use the EM system call, which is asynchronous. And I did some benchmarking, and it turns out it roughly doubles the throughput. Um, if you just if you fire off a bunch of uh, operations to identify a bunch of JPEGs, it, it roughly doubles the throughput. <coughs> this is how it's implemented. The run command method up here is, is essentially uh, what is essentially what Mini Magic is executing. The key thing is this 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 execute method here. In Mini Magic, it's this implementation down here which is blocking. It's just using the backticks to execute a command, and then returning the output of the command along with the, the status the exit the exit code of the process. I wrote an event driven version of that method called evented execute, which just uses fibers to make it look like the exact same, it returns the exact same data. So mini magic doesn't know the difference. <coughs> and so we can switch between blocking execute and evented execute really, really simply. And again, for those, you know, ten, uh, five or 10 lines of code change, you get roughly double the throughput. Um, we use Postgres SQL at one spot, and so any sort of evented code that we were to write would, uh, <coughs> scalability would suffer a lot if we didn't have a database driver. <coughs> Unfortunately, no one stepped up and wrote a driver for Postgres SQL for active record in the event machine, so I stepped up and did it. Um, it requires Ruby 1.9 because active record is a blocking API. That is, it calls the database driver and then it expects it to return the results. <coughs> so it uses fibers so that it, it looks like a blocking API. It's on my GitHub. You all can check it out if you use PostgreSQL. Um, there is an, an asynchronous database driver for MySQL called MySQL Plus. If you use MySQL, you just use that. It's pretty simple. But the key to implementing this database driver was actually pretty simple because a database driver at the, at the heart of it all it's, it's just a single method, which basically says, send the SQL to the database, and then get the results back. That's what most, that's 99% that's of the guts of most database drivers. So really all I had to event was one method, this execute method. And you can see we're doing the same fiber stuff that I showed earlier in my slides. Grabbing the current fiber, we're setting up the asynchronous calls, so we passed in the SQL, we're calling the query method to actually set up the database connection and fire off the SQL, and then we're telling it, here's the success callback, or here's the callback that you call it either way. And that passes us in a couple parameters. When we yield, we know that when the yield returns, that we're gonna get those three parameters that were passed in the block. And then if, if status is true, then that means the call succeeded. We just translate that into a Postgres result object and return it. And that's all Active Record expects. Active Record just re re expects this PG result object. So the query with a callback, is that part of the uh, underlying driver? That's or part of the underlying uh, event machine Postgres 3 protocol. <coughs> it provides this asynchronous API. And I just wrote this execute method as a synchronous version of that API using fibers. Yes. Um, where's the callback method coming from? Is that coming from the event machine? Yes, that's, that's in this, this um, 
that's in this Postgres 3 protocol that event machine implements. So event machine does provide this asynchronous API, but again, it requires callbacks for everything. So I just made this execute method, which takes that asynchronous API and makes it look synchronous so that it works with active record. Any other questions? Yes. Can you step through that and say when each of those lines have Sure. Sure. So first we get the current fiber. We set up we set up the query. Alright, and that hands us back a um, what's called a deferrable. And the deferrable is something that uh, event machine will call back once it is finished. Sorry, so query, that's not part of that record. That's part of, that's part of the event machine. Event machine. Yes. It's, it's a, this query method uh -huh. is, <coughs> is in this class, Postgres 3 class. Okay. We're adding another method to this class that is a synchronous version. That, that class, Postgres 3? Yes. Why? It provides a number of protocols that are asynchronous versions. It provides a memcached um, protocol. So they just kind of pick them out of like commonly used? Yes, exactly. Okay. <coughs> There's a HTTP client, for instance. Um, okay, so, so query returns a deferrable object. Uh, one of the methods on deferrable is callback, which says when this deferrable is finished, call this block. So essentially, we're just calling this method to tell event machine call this block when this this query is finished. Okay. So this executes, and then we jump down to fiber yield. Fiber yield executes, and then we're done. We pause. This fiber stops. Data event machine the execution goes back into event machine. It fires off the SQL onto the socket, and then calls IO select. You know the, the select system call to wait, essentially, for that to return. Once it returns, it's, it's associated the, uh, the deferrable with the, um, with the select operation. So once, once uh, data comes back, it knows that this deferrable is done. It calls the set of callbacks that have already been associated with that deferrable. 99% of the time, you're only going to have one callback, the one callback that we set up. So it's going to execute this callback now. All it does is call fiber resume, and then boom, our application is executing again. Okay. We return the three, we return the, the arguments to the callback, and, and now we're just doing our business as usual. And Ruby, Ruby, is, the, Ruby is the thing that's handling that, what, what seems weird having never used fibers, where the like, remainder of the method actually isn't run, it's just Right, like all, all the lines after the fiber and yield, those don't, those aren't, like fiber yield is. It's an asynchronous it's like break. Like a weird return. Yeah, it's, it, yeah, effectively what's happening is your, your, this executes, which transfers control to some other fiber somewhere else. Okay. It's, I mean, fibers are literally user controlled threads. So you've got multiple fibers executing, <coughs> but only one at a time. And so you jump from one to another, and, and you can you could jump anywhere, but you only jump to places where you've yielded. So that yield pauses until the resume is called. Exactly. Does it, does it pause into the resume? Okay, I got you. So when you call fiber.yield, it jumps into the query SQL callback. It jumps into some other fiber that's ready to run. 99% of the time, that's going to be the, the root fiber, which is what event machine should be running on. Okay, The only thing in that root fiber is just the event machine core, where it knows I'm listening for successful I.O. operations. Right. Once those I.O. IO operations are done, it just calls back into, into whatever callbacks have been set up. Essentially, fiber yield is a, is a method call that never returns. It does return. It does return. It does no, it doesn't return. You get called the callback. It returns when you resume by fiber. Resume says resume wherever you left off. And that does the return. Okay. One thing that we remember is that 
Ruby blocks are lazy evaluation, and that block is sort of executed. All that's done is the code is stored someplace, right. and then it will act not actually execute until when the vent machine says, "I'm ready to do you." So that you know that block in there does not get executed, you know, right after the callback. And, and notice we're having to use Ruby's closures because we have to keep track of which fiber was current when this callback executes. We can't call fiber.current.resume because the fiber that this callback is called on is the event machine fiber, right? You have to transfer control from the from event machine into my application's fiber. And so I need to store that fiber here so that in the callback I can, I can resume it. Does that make sense? It's a real mind twist, and this is why event machine is difficult to understand. The code flow is not one, two, three. Sometimes it's one, three, two. <laughs> um, any other questions so far? Yes. Yeah. So somewhere way up your stack in your controller, you've got like a find call. Mm -hmm. So and that find call is blocking or not blocking. It continues because of this code. Um, this method is for all these purposes asynchronous, uh, uh, right? Yes, yes. Like this, this method is synchronous to the outside world. The outside world does not know that internally it's asynchronous <coughs> because of the fiber yield and resume business. That's what turns the asynchronous API into a synchronous API. And that's why Active Record can use it. Because Active Record just expects to call exec with a SQL statement and then get a result set back. It does not expect to pass in a block, which is called when the SQL's ready, right? Yeah, so your find in your controller <coughs> is going to block. But if you've got multiple controller accesses simultaneously, then in theory, this is going to enable them to complete much faster. You're not trying to make the one find faster. Yeah. <coughs> all the simultaneous. All the simultaneous. Yeah, that's what I'm Finds doing. faster. <coughs> exactly. You're still going to want to set up indexes, something like that, because that'll make the asynchronous call come back sooner, right? But the asynchronicity allows us to do to handle more than one operation concurrently. Right? Well, just to just to make sure, in your control, let's say hypothetically, you have three finds. Mm -hmm. It's no faster than Active Record today. This example, correct? No faster, correct? Okay. Just making sure. Yep. It's a not it's not a way of improving performance. It's a way of improving concurrency or scalability without using threads. Yes. Um, how would you do this in one <laughs> without fibers? In one eight, yeah, without fiber, <coughs> uh, you can't. Okay. Uh, you might be able to use um, uh, continuations or call CC. Call CC <laughs> is a way of implementing. It's it's how fibers are implemented in C. I don't know how many of you know the call CC um, standard uh, C function. But um, it's essentially what's behind this business of jumping from one part of the code to another um, without like unrolling the stack. Essentially, it's it's tough to understand. But um, but you would have to implement your. I mean, either no matter what you do, you're going to have to have something like a fiber if you want to turn an asynchronous I/O into a synchronous I/O. Okay. So how would you actually take advantage of this? Is what I'm confused. So you just said no faster than, than any mm -hmm. normal active record. So I actually have to run. Is it just multiple process? I mean, obviously, then that's what we're back no, to what we always did. No, the point is, is while while this fiber has yielded to event machine, mm -hmm. some other operation can be on the CPU processing. But you'd have to actually set that up with other fiber yields, right? Or other fibers. The 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 point is, is that any any blocking I/O that you do, if you set it up to use event machine event machine can context switch to other operations while your operation is paused, so waiting for the database CPU. results. Sorry? So that could be anything. That could be another thread, anything. Well, you, the idea is we're not using threads here. I know. That's why I'm, that's why I'm <coughs> but confused. The point, but the point <laughs> is, is something like Thin would set up each request to be its own fiber. Ah. Okay. So you can have multiple requests processing concurrently. Because while sense. one request is waiting for the database, Another another fiber, another request on another fiber, maybe hitting memcache, maybe um, you know hitting a web service. So you really need to, you need thin on top of this to take advantage of it. You have to have event machine running, sure. right? In in some sort of container. If you only used it in this one spot, it wouldn't help you at all.
You have to use it here, and then you have to use it in the request cycle. You have to use it okay. all well, over. Well, this, this assumes that you've set up your code to run within a fiber. You have to have a current fiber for this to work. Right? So <clears throat> that is, um, that is, again, that's part of the global context that needs to be set up outside of your application code. This is not running on. It's not Ruby threads, but isn't it operating system threads? Or if not, is this thread still there? It's just the operating system is managing those threads instead of Ruby no. threads? Well, no, this is not. Well, I explained it in a previous slide about threads, but Ruby's threads are not implemented um, very well in terms of scalability. So Ruby 1.8 doesn't even have operating system threads. It has um, user threads, which are essentially fibers and Ruby just context switches between them, it's on its own. The operating system doesn't know anything about it, and so therefore they only run on one CPU. Okay. Um, in Ruby 1.9, you have real actual native threads, but because um, there's a global interpreter lock, you can only have Ruby executing on one thread at a time. You essentially can't take advantage of multiple cores with threads in Ruby. This isn't taking advantage of multiple cores either, right? Correct. The Mint Machine will tag a single core, but because we're single threaded, we're only going to run on a single processor. So if you're on a fully box, you may be running multiple event machines. I'm sorry, say that again? Would you, would you run multiple event machines on the same box? You'd run four cores, four processes. Yes, and then each process can peg a core. That's simpler than what we do today, which is kind of <laughs> guesstimate. Yeah, well, exactly. Like I was saying, at one spot, we do one one message per process at a time. So we have we fire up ten of them, and each one takes up 200, 300 megs. Now you're talking two or three gigabytes of RAM. If you can do the same amount of work with only two or three processes, you dramatically drop the amount of RAM you need, while also guaranteeing that you're going to peg your CPUs. <coughs> I think you have a block. You had this before, but can you um, sort of explain what happens um, when you call the Neo who's kind of living on the fiber class? What's really what's going on there? And that's, that's too below the, you know. It's, it's really hard to explain, and I'm okay. <clears throat> not sure I can explain it very well, much less if I understand it very well. But um, I, I would do a little research. If you're, if you're interested, um, go to Wikipedia and look up user threads or green threads. Um, look up the call CC method in the standard, in the, in the C standard library. Um, yeah, I mean, essentially what you're doing is you're jumping from one place in the code to another um, without the normal unrolling of the stack. So you're not you're not returning from you're not returning from the method to to go somewhere else. You're just literally jumping from one point in of execution to another. Um, <coughs> it, it, again, I, I don't to explain it very well. What's getting executed? I mean, I, I, the block is getting executed on fiber yield, but is that because there is a fiber that is, in the, what, that is, that is lifted by that closure? <coughs> what we've done is we've said, we've said that, uh, we've told the event machine that we want to execute this SQL, right? And then we've also told it when that SQL is finished, execute this callback, execute this block. Okay? And then we yield. That yield transfers control to event machine. Now all event machine knows is when that query is done, it calls, it jumps back into that callback. So is event machine hooking into the fiber infrastructure? No. All event machine knows about is this callback. Okay. It doesn't know anything about fibers. But this callback knows about fibers. Right. So does so is fiber.yield executing fiber.resume? Fiber.yield is controlled of event machine. An event machine is going to invoke that callback, which then calls fiber.resume. Right. So in a, in, in a way, what you're trying to say, I think, is that this code, these this line, these lines are executed on the application's fiber. This line is executed on a bit machine fiber. Okay. The thing, so, the thing that might clarify this is stop thinking about fibers like you normally think.
threads where you yield and it goes to some random fiber. That's not how fibers work in Ruby or indeed in a lot of quantum threading. So what happens is there's some uh, original fiber, which of course would be a event machine in this case. And when you create a fiber, it's not running. You have to explicitly resume it for the fiber to run in the first place, which is what has happened at some point. Pretty thin in your case, but right somewhere along the line. For example, when the connection is accepted, it will start up a fiber and pass it in and go. Now, when you say yield, it specifically goes back to the thread that resumed it. That means event machine. In other words, think of it like a, like spokes. The event machine yes. is calling out to whatever fibers it wants, which runs for a period of time and says yield. At that moment, it goes back to the center of the spoke. So it's not like, you know, when you normally think of threads, you think of like a million things going at once and the operating system's allowing crap to run with some complicated design of what, what's been stalled out and priorities and all kinds of stuff. No, none of that is valid for fibers. When you say yield, it goes back to the fiber who resumed it. End of story. Yeah, I forgot so about it's, that. It's yeah. really like a, a stack based call thingy. Like, that's a better way to think of it. Because <laughs> when you say yield, it pops the stack back to the previous fiber. It just also preserves where you were. Right. So when you say resume, it can put that, that can arm of the stack back on. That's a good point. So Thank is, you. Is, is one spot, um, uh, not a technical question, is one spot seeing some, you know, was there some some financial throughput problem in dealing with Amazon and your scale that, that necessitated this? You were preparing for, for, for more growth, is this more manageable, is more money for this? Yes and no. Next question. I mean, you know, I, I just think it's ridiculous <laughs> that we should have a several hundred megabyte process, right. which is using a tenth of the CPU and processing a multi so you, you did this on principle because it was a, an improvement that could be done and it was, it was I mean, reachable. We're, we're, we're like a, a huge user of Amazon's APIs. Mm -hmm. I mean, we've got an account rep there and, and, and they know us. I mean, we're, we're paying them a pretty penny every month. And we want, we want to get the maximum utilization for our dollar. So that's exactly what this translates into. And that's why I'm somewhat offended by our current system and how inefficient it is. <laughs> you know, there's also a flexibility thing. I, I also worked at one spot. So we have we have a lot of different queues and we have different processors for those queues. But to avoid having all these processors, we sort of glom some of those together where you have, you know, pro you can put multiple different kinds of messages on a single queue and then that processor will pull it off. And it would be and sometimes a message of a certain kind will fill up the queue and the other kinds get starved for a little while. And be more efficient from a scalability standpoint to have, you know, dedicated types of processors and separate queues for every kind of message. But if if that that specific kind of process doesn't happen frequent, frequently enough, you can't really justify the cost of having all these idle processes sitting around waiting to manage queues that, that are mostly empty. And so here we can we can we can deal with that in a much more effective. How, how far have you pushed this from a uh, complexity of the application? Certainly, you know, the, the thumbnail application ends up being pretty, you know, at least non-complicated logic, pretty straightforward solution. Even the driver here ends up pretty straightforward solution. How far have you pushed this in terms of program complexity? And I'm, I'm wondering what that translates to really from like maintenance and debug, you know, problem res resolution type headache. I'm thinking we've got a big migration tool that's running 35 Ruby processes to try to move data from a legacy system to a new system and are queuing and doing a bunch of work. And it's, and it's, I know it's got tons of blocking items. We're reading from an, you know, a legacy database, munging some data up and pushing it into the new. But I'm hesitant to say, I mean, there's, we've got thousands of lines of code in there. You know, what, are we, what would introducing this, something like this do to it from a... That's why, that's why I've sort of stressed fibers in Ruby 1.9 here. Um, fibers are only in Ruby 1.9. Um, but because of APIs like this, you can essentially make your blocking I.O. into asynchronous I.O. while making it look like it's blocking to your higher level application code. And so that means that you don't need to retrain developers on a totally different way of, of writing Ruby code. That's why I'm not a big fan of Event Machine in Ruby 1.8. Because like it or not, you have to do that callback style, which is completely different from the way we're used to looking at Ruby code. But when you when you you know harness the power of fibers here, it, it, you know you can basically turn any API into a normal looking 
procedural API. You, you still end up with stuff like this too if your I.O. bandwidth is pegged by what you're already doing. This isn't going to help you out either. Right? Uh, yes. <clears throat> so you have to know that you have more bandwidth in your I.O. to say, I'm gonna, I want to kick off more I.O. concurrently. Space for that. Yeah, I mean, if, if your Ruby processes right now are are filling up the pipe, um, then you're good to go. But I mean, if, if it's taking 10 Ruby processes and sure. two gigabytes of memory to fill up that pipe, maybe you can fill up the pipe with one Ruby process and 250 megs instead. So, so to pathetically volunteer somebody else, Bob, do you want to? I mean, we, we've used the vent machine a bunch. Or what are the use cases? I think there's two real ones for us that have been useful: <coughs> processing queues and then mass fetches of like a whole bunch of HTTP requests at once. Yeah, so we have a part of our application which has to generate an RSS feed from like multiple S3 objects. So we have a Rails thing that doesn't use fibers; it actually uses um, threads to kind of do the same thing that you're doing there with fibers. But we use it to so the user doesn't have to wait for us to do 25 sequential yeah. um, things there. You can you can use um, asynchronous HTTP APIs that don't use event machine necessarily. Right. Um, like Typhus, um, lib uh, lib multi curl I think multi curl will also do. Um, you can t say fetch these twenty web pages, and it'll go out and fetch all twenty at the same time, and it'll re return once all twenty have come back. So you don't have to do twenty one at a time. You're doing twenty in parallel effectively. And essentially what it's doing internally is it's setting up a little mini reactor, setting up each of those columns, <coughs> and then the, the reactor shuts down and returns the data once it's done. So it's like a little tiny event machine that's being run at that, at that just for that one API call. Yes. So that brings up an interesting question. Let's say you want to do what you just said, start the mini reactor and return something. So obviously you can't literally return from the outer mm -hmm. reactor run because that returns immediately. So how do you return something that comes out of the in, inner block? Whether it, I guess with fibers, that's the answer, right? Like, you use fibers and that's less issue. Um, I guess. I, I mean, I guess I guess your question is so abstract that I'm not sure how to answer it. Well, in your Ruby 1.8, if I'm machine thing, you had nested blocks. Mm -hmm. How do you return something from the inner block to some somewhere else? But like you just said, I have 20 things. When you can done. use... Um, uh, Yes, Clo closures, right? You set yeah. a variable to nil on the in the out outside of it, yeah. and then in the callback you set its value to something. Yeah. And once that block is done, that the value of the outer variable should be set. Okay. Anything else? Let's see more slides. Yeah, I was going to say this is a long slide, <laughs> <laughs> and the stock's gone on long. Glad the other guy didn't make it, I guess. Mike, I guess I have one question. Say you've got enough memory. Um, that that you can have multiple rubies running. Would this have an advantage over, say, running like Passenger, where it's just running multiple instances of Ruby? <coughs> Does anyone have any opinions there? Yeah, fibers are more efficient always. Um, I mean, think about it. Okay, let me let me ask this question: Which resource is it efficient in? Well, first of all, RAM. That guy said RAM was well, not, yeah, I, mean, not, I understand that. RAM is not a consideration. Uh, but it is because you still have to deal with ramifications of virtual paging or, you know, whatever, level one cache, like, it doesn't matter. Okay. It, 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 is, it is always slower to occupy more RAM. I, I would say, sort of, uh, you know, aside from his answer, okay, and the, if, in the aside from RAM, I understand well, those The second thing is context switching. Yeah. Because in fibers, it's okay, a, as close you. to as close to little you know, zero context switch as possible. You change some registers from the standpoint. And of course, I'm sure it's more complicated than Ruby, but it's 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 small. It, you're not going, for example, back into kernel space to do a switch like you would with a regular thread. Okay. That was essentially what I was going to say. When you when you're context switching in the application, it's always going to be faster than if you do it in the operating system, where it has to switch the entire process as context, as opposed to just a stack pointer or two. So you get a little bit of a CPU benefit also. So if I'm if I were to repartition my queues into application specific queues, how do I bind those queues in the queue processing to different cores? Say I'm on an eight-way core, how do I bind that? 
Um, traditionally, or normally, you don't you don't bind a particular process to a core. You just you fire up the number of processes that you have of cores, and the operating system generally will will try to um, <coughs> try to set an affinity for one particular process, or to save you know save caching so that the caches don't need to be um, uh, set as invalid and that sort of thing. But it generally, from from an application developer's perspective, you don't you don't do anything. You just fire up the number of processors that you have of cores. <coughs> That's assuming that each process can pick the core. Okay. Anything else? Okay. So that was a very long-winded way to get to my conclusion, which is threading sucks. <laughs> um, it sucks in Ruby. Uh, it sucks overall, in my in my opinion, frankly. Um, Multi-threaded code is, is hard to write. It's hard to debug. If you've ever had to track down a deadlock or a race condition, um, it, being non-deterministic, it's just hard to deal with. If if, if you've got bugs in there, and, and we all write bugs in our code, um, at least I do. So blocking I/O is everywhere. Um, we know that for our message queue processor to work. We need a couple bits of information so that we can finish the processing, and, and getting those bits of information can sometimes mean we have a web service or we call the database. So you're going to use it, or you're going to have blocking I/O. So what we do is use Event Machine for those blocking I/O operations, and that allows us to context switch at each of those I/O operations to some other operation that <coughs> maybe can process on the CPU in the meantime. If the machine can peg one core, we just set up multiple processes to peg all of our cores. So four cores, four of the machines running. And that saves us a lot of memory. <coughs> and uh, like I've been saying over and over, a Ruby 1.9 and fibers makes a vented code usable in my, in my opinion. It looks a lot more like normal, traditional Ruby code. And that's it. Now you may applause. <laughs> Any questions, but I'm kind of hesitant. <laughs> <laughs>